All right, I'm going to be teaching on hell this morning. So hell this morning, uh, I know I've taught on it before, but it's, I think it's good we visit it again. <clears throat> so you have a biblical view of hell. A lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about hell. Uh, so I want to teach you what the Bible shows us and reveals to us about hell this morning. So I've got a few points there, and we'll come back to Luke 16 in a moment. So seven things I want to tell you about hell. And, I, and you know, if we understand what hell is, we won't have misconceptions, but also if we internalize, you know, what hell really is and the fact that it's real, then, you know, that's a, that's a good motivator for you to preach the gospel. You know, I think it's good for us to preach the gospel out, out of love, but what we have to remember as well, what are we saving people from? You know, there was an interesting, uh, what is a quote from, you know, uh, was it, is his name, uh, his name's Penn, right, from Penn and Teller? So Penn is a, quite a famous atheist. But he did like a sort of vlog once and he said, oh, you know, people always try and preach the gospel to him. And even though he's not a believer, you know, he's quite a famous atheist. He speaks out against, you know, religion and Christianity. He said in his, this vlog, he said, you know, if I really believed hell is real, I would be, you know, quite a, I think he used the word a-hole, right, a-hole, if I didn't tell people how to be saved from it. You know, so he even recognizes that, you know, to be consistent with your beliefs, if you believe that hell is a real place and that people go to hell when they die without Jesus Christ, what sort of person are you to keep that information to yourself and to not tell others how to be saved? Um, so him, even as an atheist, can acknowledge that, but some Christians don't even internalize that themselves. All right, and that's why, you know, I, when I talk to people, I say this is why Christians ought to be quite you know, zealous about preaching the gospel and explaining the gospel to other people because if we believe these things are real, you know, we would do something about it. Do you believe these things are real? Well, that's my first point. My first point is hell is real. Hell is not, you know, an analogous place like some, you know. So because hell, hell is such a terrible place that, that people don't want it to exist. You know, this is why they don't want it to be eternal. They don't want it to be a place of fire. They try and explain it away, but it's not. It's a real place. And not believing in it doesn't change whether it exists or not. You know, people say, well, I don't need to worry about going out because I don't believe in it. Well, that's not really an argument for, for it doesn't exist. That's like saying, if you don't believe Australia exists, that doesn't mean it's not there. You know, so it's not really an argument. They, they, can, they can say what they don't believe in it, but it's not an argument for why it doesn't exist. Right? So... Not believing in it doesn't change whether it exists, but I think this is, you know, I think this is one just natural response of why a lot of religions want to explain away hell, because it is such a terrible place when you see what the Bible tells us about it. But in Luke 16, we get an idea of, you know, what somebody who goes to hell is thinking. So Luke 16, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. That just means he ate well every day, right? It's like a sumptuous meal. Fed somebody, he just did, he's, he's, he's doing well every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be <coughs> fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his, his sores. <coughs> and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So there's so much in this passage I can talk about. But I just want to make the point at the end of you know, what this rich man who dies... He doesn't go to purgatory or anything. He dies in hell. He lifts up his eyes. So there's no... See, some people think that when you die, you know, you, you can talk about it with the big man. You know, oh, they, they joke, you know, like when I die, I'll, you know, I'll you know, have a yarn with the big man upstairs and I'll talk my way, you know, talk, talk to him and, you know, hopefully get myself into heaven. Well, they joke about it, but that's not how it works, you know, because when you die without Jesus Christ, you're already condemned. It's not you go there and then you a judge and then condemned. You're already condemned, right? The white throne judgment is just a relocation of hell. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. 
right? So we know that in, in hell, this, this rich man is burning in hell. He's feeling it, but he's not being consumed, right? So he's being tormented in this flame. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And here's the, the very profound bit, right? When we say, like, what are people in hell thinking? Right? Well, one is they're realizing that they're burning in hell and there's no reprieve from it. He wants Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue because he's tormented, but there's no reprieve from this torment. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, he's begging him, that thou wouldest send him, who? Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So you can see that he's not being consumed. It's a place of punishment. It's a place of pain. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What is he saying? They have the word of God. They can hear the word of God. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He's begging Abraham, Send somebody to tell my loved ones about hell so they don't come here. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So it seems like a bit of a cold response. And it's like, well, they have the Bible. If they don't hear the Bible, they won't even be persuaded, even if I sent Lazarus to go preach to them. But you know, it's interesting that he says, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Because who I believe he's referring to here, Jesus. Right? Because Jesus did rise from the dead. Right? And he's telling people about hell. Right? Well, he taught them about hell. He did rise from the dead. And yet people still do not believe the gospel because now they don't even believe that he rose from the dead. So a lot of people, you know, this is a very clear passage where Jesus is telling a story between two people where one goes to heaven and one goes to hell. But like I said, a lot of people don't want to believe hell exists. A lot of people don't, don't believe hell exists whether they want to or not because of false doctrine. So they try and say that this, this passage... They say, well, this is, this is just a parable. That's why you don't have to take it literally. But see, that objection doesn't make sense because if this is just a parable, a parable is when you, you use something that is real, right, to, to explain a spiritual truth. So think about the parable of the sower. A sower is a real thing. Seed is a real thing. You know, like when we have the husbandman, you know, the parables of husbandmen and sheep and things like that. So you're using real things to explain spiritual things. So even if you were to say, well, this is a parable, well, then it, hell must be real and these people, there must be people in order for it to mean something else. Well, see, what's the lesson from this parable? But it's not a parable, right? It's, it's actually a story of two people where you're given a name of the, of the beggar. But what I'm saying is, if they try and explain it away by saying, well, this is just a parable, that doesn't make sense. Because hell is the real thing that's being used in this to, to teach what? Right? So, so a parable must use real things to teach, uh, like earthly things, to, to teach a spiritual truth. So if this is a parable, what truth is it teaching? Right? Well, hell is real. That's, that's, do you get, I don't really get what I'm saying there. So, people that scoff at hell don't really know what it's like. You know, you'll, pe you'll hear people say, they joke, oh, you know, I want to go to hell because all my friends will be there. Oh, we want to go to hell because there's a, you know, a party, everyone, everyone's going to be there, it's going to be great. Well, no. See, because look, we have a story where somebody goes to hell and that's not what they're thinking. What they're thinking is, it's a terrible place. It's a place of torment. There's no reprieve. And I don't want anyone to go there. Right? That's what they're thinking. Right? So that's not what the rich man was thinking when he went to hell. You know, he wasn't thinking that it's a great place and all his friends are there. Look at what Jesus says in Mark 9, verse 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. You know, I think of this verse, sometimes we read over this verse, we don't realize how graphic Jesus is being. You know, I remember that movie, a really like gross movie, that horror movie, Saw, you know, where the guy's like stuck in the room and he's like chained. Um, and then finally in that, in that movie, 
right? And he's given a saw, that's why it's called a saw, and he has to decide, do I stay being tormented in this room, or do I literally cut, I think he has to cut his leg off. It's like, so he literally has to, he saws his own leg off to escape this room. I think what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying here, hey, you know, you know what's worse than sawing your own leg off and sawing your own hand off? is going to hell. That's worse. And he says, hey, it's better for you to cut your own hand off than it is to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm <coughs> dieth not, <coughs> and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Pluck it out. That's, that's, that's pretty... Uh, you know, if you think about it, I know, I know the words, you know, in English today, when we think pluck, you know, we think of like, you know, plucking roses, you know, when you go for a nice walk in the sun. But, you know, imagine ripping your eye out of its socket. And, the Bible, and Jesus is saying here, you know, that's better for you. That's better for you than to go to hell and to the fire that shall, can, cannot be quenched, where their worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. Let me ask you, I mean, if, if hell is not real, I mean, why would Christ warn about it in such graphic detail? If it's not even a place that you go to. He's saying it's better for you to cut your hand up, better for you to cut your foot off, better for you to rip your own eye out of its socket if hell is not a real place. Right? So, number one, hell is real. And I hope you internalize that. And I hope you take that on. That hell is a real place. I hope that motivates you to, to do something. You know, get people in the kingdom of God. Number two, hell is eternal. Hell is eternal. I'll show you a couple of verses here. Revelation 14, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented. So there's that same word from Luke 16. In this place of torment, tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. So you see there the smoke of their torment, right? So some people say, well, they're destroyed, but the smoke is just forever, right? But why would it be called the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever? Because the, the torment is where the smoke is coming from. But if there's nobody there to be tormented, how can you have smoke of torment? So I don't think it's a very strong argument for them to just say, well, the smoke is there, but they're not actually there anymore. Right? They were just tormented temporarily, but then you know, the smoke's just forever. Right? So, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Because, the, the, you know, this is one of the worst things about hell, right? One of the worst things about hell is that it goes on forever and ever. You think if one day it stops, at least when you go to hell, one day it's over. But no, you go to hell and then it's forever and ever and ever. The wrath of God abides on you and it abides on you and the wor where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. You now they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So you say as they, they have no rest day nor night, they're, then they're not there anymore, then obviously they, 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 there's no point to say they have no rest day nor night. The reason why they say they have no rest day nor night, because they're in hell having no rest day nor night. Revelation 19, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So this is when hell is relocated. It's cast into the lake of fire. But see, the beast and the false prophet are put there first, right, in these fires. Now, what's important about this is that the beast and the false prophet are men, right? These are not like heavenly creatures. These are men being thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 19, prior to the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. 
Now, in Revelation 20, we are reading now after the thousand-year reign of Christ. So this is a thousand years later. Look at what the Bible says. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So in this thousand years, Satan is in hell. He's in the heart of the earth. But after the thousand years, he's let out. Right? And all the people that don't want Jesus ruling and reigning over that thousand years, he gathers them together for one last rebellion. Right? And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And, and fire came, came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Look, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you see, a thousand years later, the beast and the false, false prophet in the lake of fire, they're still there being tormented day and night forever and ever when Satan joins them. And this is why we know it's forever. Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. <clears throat> Daniel 12, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So you see there, it lasts forever, right? <clears throat> now, some, some of them, these are some of the weaker arguments, right? So in terms of eternal hell. So we say here in Luke 16, the rich man opened his eyes and he was in hell. But some people that believe, see, people that don't believe in an eternal hell, they believe in a doctrine called annihilation. It means when you go to the lake of fire, that you no longer exist, right? So this is why the beast and the false prophet one is one that they dispute a lot. Right, because the fact that the beast and the false prophet, they're still there. Right? Some of the new Bibles don't say where the beast and the false prophet are. It says where the beast and the false prophet was or were. Right? So it changes the fact that they're no longer there. Right? But the King James Bible is very clear that they are still there when Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. But people can say about the rich man, oh, well, he was in hell, you're suffering in the hell fire. But when you get relocated to the lake of fire, that's when you're annihilated. Right? There's another one in 2 Thessalonians 1, and this is kind of where they get it from too. It says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. So they kind of use that one to say, you're destroyed forever. It's not that you're, you know, will be tormented forever. But you see the everlasting punishment kind of goes against that. Right? When you're punished forever, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. From the presence and the Lord, and from the glory of of his power. So hell is eternal. Right? Now let's go on to number three. Now some people say like, oh, you know, well, hell being eternal, well, that's, that doesn't seem very fair. That's not a very just punishment. But see, when people say that, we've got our thinking the wrong way around. Right? Because if we say, look, hell doesn't seem like a very just punishment, then we're assuming that God's punishment for sin is unjust. But we need to think of it the other way around. See, God is just, right? So we need to see if God saw hell as a fitting punishment for sin, then maybe we don't have the right perspective on sin and we don't realize how bad it is. See, we sin and we think, oh, it's not such a big deal. You know, why does it deserve such, a, such an extreme punishment? But we need to think the other way around. If God saw it fit that such an extreme punishment was was fitting for sin, maybe we're not seeing sin the way we ought to, right? And we need to see sin the way God does. Look in Genesis 18, verse 25. That be far from thee. This is uh, Abraham talking to God when he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And this is, this is an interesting parallel, right? Because Sodom and Gomorrah was an example of hell, Right? Fire and brimstone destroying a city was the, like a the sort of an earthly example of hell, right? Sodom and Gomorrah was one example. So this is what Abraham says about Sodom and Gomorrah. That, that be far from thee, so talking to God, to do after this manner. So you see how he's saying to God, like that's, that's not like you, to be unjust. But you see how he's accusing God of being unjust. To slay the righteous with the wicked 
and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. So what Abraham is kind of saying here is, well, there's righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it's not for God wouldn't be unjust to just destroy the righteous with the wicked in that city. So God, you know, in that story says, hey, well, there's so many righteous people. Abraham kind of negotiates it down to 10. But there wasn't 10, right? Because when Lot and the daughters came out with his, and with Lot's wife, it was under 10, right? So it's God still kept his word that he wouldn't destroy the city if there was more than 10, but there were less than 10. But he didn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. He removed Lot and his family, and then he destroyed the city. But the idea here is, see, Abraham is doubting God's righteousness. He's doubting his fairness, right? And saying, hey, isn't, aren't you a just God? Won't you do right? Right? But the answer to that question is, yes, he will do right. And he does do right. And that's why a hell is a righteous punishment, just like the earthly punishments in the Old Testament were wise and righteous. Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments. So you see how there's laws that God taught, but then he also had a fitting earthly punishment. Right? But hell is the spiritual punishment. Right, So that's why sin is deserving of capital punishment, but not every crime is punishable by death in an earthly sense. That ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. So God has righteous judgments, and his righteous judgment for sin is capital punishment, you know, which is eternal punishment in hell. So when it comes to, like, say, the death penalty, some people say, oh, you know, the death penalty is too harsh on some things. But then, you know, are we more righteous than God? You know, if God saw it fitting to have the death penalty on certain crimes, you know, and we want to be more lenient than that. Are we more righteous than God? You know, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If we see God has a righteous judgment on one thing, then we should adopt that because God is right and we aren't. So why is hell eternal? Well, this is how I, what I think, right? And, and this is an interesting point. Romans 8 says here, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So the idea is, it's an interesting concept, but we are saved by hope. Salvation by grace through faith. Right? So we're saved by a hope in God. But the, when hell is eternal, what it actually removes completely is hope itself. See, because if, if hell ended, then you always have a hope that one day this will be over. But then when hell is eternal, you know, this is God saying, well, you didn't hope in Jesus Christ. You didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You didn't accept that hope. And now the punishment is that hope itself no longer exists for you. You know, there is no hope when there is a judgment that is eternal. So it's almost like God gives people what they want. They don't want hope. They don't want to hope on Jesus Christ. So he removes that completely. And now in hell, it's eternal and you have no hope. All right, number four is God, hell is God's righteous judgment. And it's not Satan's headquarters. See, some people think Satan is the God of evil and he's in hell ruling and reigning down there. But that's not the case, right? Hell is a righteous judgment from God. It's not somewhere where Satan rules. Because one day Satan will be cast into hell and he will be punished there as well. So when people say out of the pits of hell, you know, it doesn't make sense because only Jesus has the keys to exit death and hell. Right? Revelation 1, this is Jesus saying here, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So the, the God of hell is not Satan. The God of hell is God. It's Jesus Christ, right? He's the God of hell. That's his prison, right? That's his punishment. Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, 
Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood, blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, so a lot of people, they take this verse and they think, well, you know, the church is going to storm the gates of hell, like hell is some stronghold for evil and demons, and we're going to fight against, you know, these evil and demons and storm the gates of hell. But that's not what this is saying, right? When it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, is that when Jesus went to hell, our rock, the gates of hell were not able to, to contain Jesus. See, because the gates are there to keep people in hell, so you can't escape. But Jesus rose again from the dead. He died, his soul went to hell, and he overcame death and hell because he has the keys of hell. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So you see, Jesus is the, both the God of heaven and hell. He has the keys of heaven and he has the keys of hell. Whosoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Matthew 23 Verse 15 says here, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. See, so to me, this doesn't mean that it's a child of somebody that comes from hell. Right? We say the child of the devil. That, that makes sense. But the child of hell means somebody who's bound for hell, right? not somebody who rules or reigns in hell like that. So you got to think of these things different because like I said, hell is not a place that Satan rules from. It's a place he's going to be sent to. Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded. These are the creatures that come out of hell. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. So this is when hell is in the center of the earth as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So see, these creatures in hell aren't sort of reigning in there. Like they come out of hell. They're out. They, it's almost in the end times, there's a period of time where there's hell on earth, where people are tormented by these creatures in hell. They're let out of hell, and they, don't, they can't die even if they want to die. And that's a bit like hell. You want it to be over, but it doesn't end. It keeps going. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall, he say unto, uh, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Look at this. Prepared for the devil and his angels. So see, one day Satan will be cast into hell. It's not somewhere he rules from. Right? So it's God's righteous judgment. It's not Satan's headquarters. I'll just skip over Isaiah 14 for sake of time, but Isaiah 14 is an Old Testament verse where it talks about Lucifer being cast down to hell in verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. All right, number five is a misconception about hell is a lot of people believe hell is is away from God's presence, right? They'll say it's separation from God, and that's not the truth, right? The reason why hell is such a terrible place is not because God is not there. It's because God is there, right? And you're a sinner in the presence of God's wrath. Let's take a look at a couple of verses. Psalm 139, verse 7. With Abel, come back and sit down, please. See, when mum's not here, the kids just think they can just wander around whatever they want. Come on, sit back down. Thank you. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
Do you need to pee? All right, go pee then. Okay. Can you take, can you just make sure he's... <laughs> if I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold thou. So you see, you can't get away from God's presence. If you go up to heaven, he's there. If you go down to hell, he's there as well. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, we already read this, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, look at this, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Right? So hell is not separation from God. Hell is in the presence of of God. And this is why it's such a terrible place. Psalm 68 verse 2, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, look at this, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. So you see, so you see how wax in the presence of fire, that's the wicked in the presence of God. 2 Thessalonians 1, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, look at this, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. See, a lot of people misunderstand 2 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 1. They think verse 9 says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. But that's not what it says. It's not away from the presence of the Lord. It's the very presence of the Lord that is causing that punishment, that everlasting destruction. All right, so hell is in God's presence. Hell is not separation from God, like a lot of Christians teach, a lot of Christians believe. Now, where is hell? This is number six. Hell is located in the center of the earth. All right, hell, that's where hell is located right now. That's why whenever the Bible talks about hell, it's always down. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and can, shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. You know, some people find it hard to believe is that hell is down there. But you know, when you see volcanoes erupt and you see how hot it is down there, it's not hard to believe that it's a hot place down there, right? Well, that's why it's, it's hard because there's hell down there. It's not just the pressure of gravity, you know? It's hell down there as well. Psalm 55, verse 15. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Ezekiel 31, verse 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell. With them that descend into the pit. Right? And all the trees of Eden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Matthew 11, verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. So you can see that hell is always down, it's always lower parts of the earth, because that's where hell is. Even when Jesus said he's going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, like Jonah was in the heart of the belly, uh, heart of the whale. So in the heart of the earth, very center there, that's where earth is. But, and my last point is, one day, hell will be relocated. All right, so you say, what's the difference between hell and the lake of fire? Well, there's two places right now, right? It's because when the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, that's out of darkness. But there's also hell in the center of the earth. But one day, hell will be relocated. And we read about this in Revelation 20. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Right, so in, before the thousand years, the only people that are cast into the lake of fire is the beast and the false prophet. Everyone else who dies without Jesus Christ goes to hell. But one day, in Revelation 20, at the great white throne judgment, right, everyone comes out of hell. Right, everyone who's dead comes, every, even every, all, we're all there too. And we have the great white throne judgment. And those who are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. But you see, first, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So the way I like to think of it is hell is relocated 
to the lake of fire, and then whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So it is right to say that when people die without Jesus Christ, they'll spend an eternity in hell. Because sometimes technically people say, well, if you spend an eternity in hell, technically you spend an eternity in the lake of fire. But it's not wrong to say you spend eternity in hell because hell is relocated. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew 10, he says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but look, rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So even Jesus refers to the lake of fire as hell, because you don't go to hell in the center of the earth with your body, right? Where does God destroy both soul and body? It's after the right throne judgment when you are resurrected back into your sinful body and then you are cast, both soul and body, into hell. Right? And that's why Jesus even calls this place hell in the Bible. Matthew 5, same, same verse, or parallel passage. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. See? And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So that's the difference between the lake of fire. And right now, they're two locations, and one day they're going to be the same location, but it's still right to call that place hell. All right, so I hope you learned some things there. So just to recap, seven things about hell. Hell is real. It's a real place. All right? Number two is hell is an eternal punishment. It never ends. That's why it's so terrible, right? And being an eternal punishment is a just punishment, right? Because the, the God of all the earth will do right and does do right, right? We need to change how we think about sin, right? Sin is worse than you think, right? Because hell is the just punishment for it. And hell is God's righteous judgment, Right? It's not Satan's headquarters. Hell is in the presence of God. Right? So the punishment for sin is not separation from God. Hell is the, in the presence of God. Hell is currently located in the center of the earth, but one day it will be relocated to the lake of fire. So, so in conclusion, just, just ask yourself, you know, do you really believe there's a hell? You, know, you might believe in a hell, you know, but do you really believe that? Do you really believe that people who die without Jesus Christ will go to a place called hell? You know, because if you meditate on that and you think of that, you, you reflect on that, you know, that ought to change your priorities in life. You know, that life is not just about living for yourself like the rich fool. You know, we need to think about what do we do in our life that will help people not go to hell. You know, and this is why we need to make sure that we're always preaching the gospel, always telling people about Jesus Christ, right? There's a lot of people that don't care, but there's a lot of people out there as well that do care, right? And it's our job to go and reach them. It's our job to tell them about Jesus Christ, All right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder this morning of this terrible punishment that we deserve, hell. And Lord, we can persuade people to believe on Jesus Christ that they do not go to hell. Help us, Lord, to be wise about how we do this. Help us, Lord, to put in the effort. It's going to require work. And one day the night is coming where we cannot work anymore. So Lord, help us. We uh, ask you to be with those that go preach the gospel this afternoon. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.